On today's show, the owner and proprietor of CFB-Graphs.com or hyphen graphs.com, whatever you want to say, college football analyst with an emphasis on TCU and the Big 12, contributor at Football Outsiders. He uh, he has a kick-ass newsletter. You can go and check it out, purpletheory.substack.com. And he is smarter than me at everything that I would like to be smart at. You can follow him on Twitter, at Stats of War. He is Parker Fleming. Parker, how are you? Doing well, Gary. Glad to uh, glad to be here. And yes, we are going with CFB Dash Graphs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> someone owns CFBGraphs.com. It's inactive. They have a Twitter account. Every uh, you know about every fifteen days, I message them and say like, "Hey, is anyone here? Hey, I'd like to buy your domain. Hey, is anyone here?" Uh, but yeah, yeah. So thank you, and I appreciate it. Uh, Kick ass is how I would describe my newsletter too. So it's nice to have some uh, external validation on that. Absolutely, absolutely. So I want to go ahead and dive right into this. This is your first time on the show. Uh, for anybody that follows the the college football analytics Twitter, I guess, uh, or has ever seen me retweet your stuff or tweet any kind of stats out or anything like that, that's what you do. Uh, kind of tell me and the audience, I guess, what are college football analytics to you, and then let's kind of get started with uh, with how you got started in it, and you know how you're involved and and why you created CFB-Graphs.com. Yeah. So, um, so college football analytics is, is nothing crazy. It's just, you know, looking at the available data and trying to figure out patterns that kind of inform us as to meaningful and persistent long-term, uh, effects, relationships, trends in college football. Um, and, and so that, you know, is a, is a, is a long, uh, can, can be a lot of things and, and, you know, it can get very, very wonky really, really quickly with all your machine learning nonsense that escapes me. Um, but I just think it's, it's, it's a really nice way to kind of confirm or deny the eye test. It's a really good way to kind of ask yourself, Hey, is, uh, are my priors, um, good or are they bad? Should I adjust them? You know, you think about, you could sit down and physically, you know, DVR everything, watch every football game every weekend, and you will not be able to make meaningful comparisons across every single team. You need something there. And, and so analytics isn't new. Most people are doing analytics right now. They're just doing them poorly by using like total yards and time of possession. Yes. Um, and so college football analytics, when we talk about that specifically and kind of the Twitter sphere that I occupy is looking at per drive, per play metrics, looking at, um, you know, throwing out some garbage time, trying to ask how do teams move the ball um, and how, how good are they uh, at it? So of course there's some obvious gaps because we don't have as, as good of data as like the NFL does on, you know, scheme alignment participation, but that's improving and we can still ask and answer some interesting questions. And so um, I got into it because I'm, I'm a liberal arts guy, uh, <laughs> double major undergrad, uh, religion and, and economics, but not the, not the mathy kind of economics, the uh, philosophy of economics kind of a guy. And so, um, out of college decided that I actually wanted to go get a PhD in economics and I needed a lot of math classes. So I went and got a master's in economics and took seven math classes in four semesters. Um, and they were all really boring, but I sat through them and I had to get credit for them. And so I started thinking, uh, Hey, How can what, I use what, this? You know, what can I do with this? And then I, you know, got started, um, on the technical side of things in economics, we use this horrible dinosaur of a program called Stata and it is just soul sucking and it's awful to work with and it makes terrible graphs. And I wanted to learn this new fancy thing called R, which is a little bit more flexible, gives you some cooler graphs, is, is open source and all that. And so I, I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to learn R and I'm going to use sports data to do it. And so I started, you know, just basically stealing baseball stats, looking at stuff that, you know, our friend Bill Conley has, has done and saying, do I like this? Could I improve on this? Um, and, and just started kind of working Working up to that, which really culminated in, you know, 2019, uh, getting, getting on Twitter and kind of establishing a presence, working with uh, a couple good friends um, to, to establish an EPA model for college football. We actually had a package um, that's now obsolete just because we haven't had time to maintain it called CFB Scraper, where people, you know, can get the play-by-play -play data on their own machines, get the EPA. Because uh, again, I, I don't want access to data to be the issue for anyone trying to do analytics. Like yeah. I want people to have data and do cool things. Um, and so from there, I just started realizing, hey, I need a tool. I, I need some way to aggregate all this that makes sense so I can write my previews. Because realistically, all this stuff I don't care about. The one thing I care about is Thursday mornings during the season, I will write a preview of TCU and their opponent. That's like, you know, 2,500 words long. It is a, it is a labor of love. It is completely psychotic, um, but I love it. And I, I refer to certain stats. I think certain, certain things are important and looking at games. I was like, I need a tool. So I started kind of building a tool and then people would ask me, Hey, where do you get those stats? 
And so I said, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll toss it up and uh, put it on a website. And so that's really what kind of started. Is like I make pretty tables and now I've kind of learned some web development and, and, and I'm building out the modules to make it uh, more of a, uh, a thing that is a good reference for people. But ultimately cfb-graphs.com is just, a, a tool that I would like to use when I'm writing previews and, and thinking about college football. And so I wanted to share that with other people because I think it can be useful. I absolutely loved it. The user interface is great. Like you've really been working on it quite a bit. Um, so R, you brought up R. That's a what close cousin of Python. I've been kind of dabbling in Python a little bit. Like I'm, I'm just a buffoon. I don't know anything about numbers or anything like that. I don't have a PhD. I didn't finish college. I went on tour. I was in a rock band. Like I... You know, I did all that, but I, I feel like I'm smart enough to be able to figure out some of the stuff. I work as an IT technician, so, you know, I've, I've got some computer stuff down, but R, close cousin to Python, is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, so what I tell people is whatever, you know, because a lot of people want to argue about R versus Python or whatever, and I just tell people, use what you know. The, the tool that you know is the best one for now. If people are starting out, I would push them to R. R has, man, this is going to get real nerdy. Um, <laughs> R has a, a kind of a, a suite of commands called the tidyverse, which is just a okay. really nice way to take data that is a rectangle, right? That, so it's, you know, it's very clean. You have a play on each line and you've got information. Right. It's a way to manipulate and analyze that that just is so much easier than Python, just subjectively. Um, and, and so that's what I really like about it. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's the same. I, I do some stuff in Python, you know, there's some web scraping and some, some dynamic modeling that I like Python for. So I, I move back between them and, and still unfortunately have to use Stata a little bit, but, um, I like, if, if, if someone's listening to this and they think, Hey, how do I get involved in sports analytics? Uh, I would say start out in R, um, if you, if you don't know anything already, but Python's a great tool as well. Okay. So start with R and then, and then move to Python. That, uh, well, okay. no, I, I would say if you, if you know Python, use that. If okay. you're looking to get into analytics at all and you don't know a programming language, I would encourage you to learn R because I think that's a little easier to get into. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you brought up, you know, PhD and uh, graduated and all that good stuff. Where does the love from T or for TCU come from? Where does yeah, yeah. It, is that all from alma mater or is that a family thing or or what's up? No, I, I uh, so so one. I do feel compelled to say I am I am not Doctor Fleming yet. I uh, I'm, I'm I'm ABD, <laughs> so I'm still working on it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I did undergrad at TCU. Gotcha. Uh, I really hadn't heard of them much beyond going to the Liberty Bowl in Memphis, where I grew up, um, and, and seeing them play one year. Right and, where I uh, am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, and so I got a I got a mailer that had Ladanian Tomlinson and purple oh, on it, yes. and I was like, this sounds pretty cool. And so we went and visited, and of course it was Texas, and we went to Six Flags, and we ate Mexican food, and I was like, oh, this would be really fun. I love Robert Earl Keen, and you know, scholarship worked, and so I <laughs> stepped on campus and started wearing purple. Absolutely. All right. So you you brought up stats. You said EPA. I want to get into some of these specific stats for you know the nerds out there that don't know that they're nerds yet, but may be interested in this. EPA, uh, kind of explain it for me, uh, you know, why your site, you know, uses that metric or why you prefer to use that metric uh, on top of everything else. And, you know, some other things about it, like the difference between offensive EPA, defensive EPA, what the margin means. Um, and I, tell me this on the front end, is it adjusted at all for strength of schedule? Yeah. So the, the numbers <laughs> as they are right now are raw. I have an adjustment that I use for my picks. I'm, I'm still working through the, um, shall I say, political economy of posting my exact numbers for, for picks makes, online. Makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> and so those are, you know, those are left as an exercise. What's cool about EPA though, is that largely you have a good sense of, oh, okay, this is probably way higher. So like BYU is second right now. Um, in EPA margin because they're tenth and defensive EPA. BYU did not have the tenth best defense last year. They played a terrible <laughs> schedule. Like you can know that. So I'm not as worried about those because EPA is a descriptive stat. And so what I mean by that is it's backwards looking. It's saying given down distance yard line and a couple other factors, uh, how much did you improve? or hurt your situation on a per play basis. And so EPA expected points added is really a solution to a problem. And here's the problem. The, the, the prime efficiency uh, metric that people have used so far has been yards per play, right? Uh, yeah. You know, and, and, and yards per play is fine. You have a high yards per play, you're doing pretty well. If you got a low one, you're not doing great. There's a problem there because yards per play um, can be really confusing. If you get three yards on first and 10, that's bad. 
if you get three yards on third and three, that's good. Not all yeah. yards are created equal, so which successful. is exactly the premise of EPA. Yeah. And, and so uh, EPA really solves that problem by just translating yards to points in context and gives us a measure to compare across situations the value that you added on a per play basis. Um, it's, it's effectively a, an explosiveness weighted success rate because it's, it not just, it's not just a binary, did you succeed or did you not? It actually weights the situation for how much you succeeded or how much you failed. Um, and so it, it's, it's very similar to like weighted on base average in baseball. Uh, you know, you have batting average and you say, hey, did you, get a, did you hit a hit or not? But then there's more things that happen. And then we know, hey, there's run values attributed to these. Football is a little messier because there aren't as neat game states and it's not, it's not finite like baseball is. Um, but, but it is really um, a way for me to kind of say, I can weight the, the quality of your successes to get an average of how efficient you are and how explosive you are, which are two of the most important things um, in, uh, in, 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 football success. It's really nice to look at it compared to success rate because it kind of gives you a, Hey, were you generating value through a couple explosive plays or were you generating value through, you know, moving the ball consistently and, and success rate. Um, and so that can tell you a whole lot about a team. So offensive EPA is, is just great. It is just a great stat. It, it is just so easy to tell, Hey, how well you did. It's such an improvement over so many things that we use. Defensive EPA is, is, is noisier. There's just a lot going on. Um, it, it's a little bit more confusing again, still, still a good metric, but like I showed with BYU, it's going to be way more subject to the quality of offenses you played. It's going to be way more subject to, um, individual matchups that we don't have data points for and, and stuff like that. So well, here, let me, uh, let me stop you. The top five defensive EPA from last year, San Diego state, Tulsa, Marshall, Colorado state, Miami, it schedule, right? Yep, all, all fine defenses, but yeah. not the five best defenses in the nation, right? Like like West Virginia at number six has a case to be the best defense in the nation last year. Iowa at number, what is that, eight? Uh, yep. Cincinnati at number nine. Like, right, those, those are teams you think, okay, yeah, that matters. But you can see that it, it's going to be highly co context dependent, which again, doesn't mean, and again, if you're looking at Marshall and looking at West Virginia and using, you know, three decimal places to make an argument about those two. That's probably, that's probably not the best way to do <laughs> analytics. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are some opponent considerations that need to be made, but mostly defensive EPA is, is, is a little less predictive, a little crazier. And so actually that EPA margin is a weighted average of offense and defense that trends more towards offense because offensive EPA per play is highly correlated with win probability in a game. Right. Right. And so all that means just you, you increase, increase your offensive EPA per play, you increase your win probability so substantially that that's really what matters. Um, and so that, that, you know, defense still matters and we still account for it, but I'm, I've kind of tuned into a weighted average that, that leans a little bit more towards offense that gives me a better predictive um, measure and, and a better way to kind of compare teams. Now you did bring up, so I, I do want to get into uh, expected points per drive, uh, which I, I think that's what XPPD is, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I need to work I, on my branding. I've got too many X's in there, but yeah, it's, it's, but uh, yeah. you've got a glossary section. It's, it's, you know, it's being worked on and that's okay. Uh, but yeah. you, you did bring up some things that, you know, for anybody that really wants to dive into the analytics of it, Bill Conley, one of the godfathers of college football analytics, uh, he detailed his five predictive factors back in 2015, which, uh, that's over at footballstudyhall.com. The article is still up. You can go find it. Uh, he found correlations between these stats and winning and losing, and it's it's based on these five things. It's one points per play or explosiveness or explosiveness, excuse me, uh, success rate or efficiency, field position, so the average starting field position, uh, finishing drives, so that's points per drive inside the forty, and turnovers or uh, or havoc rate. Um, it, uh, what you're using on the site kind of entails some of that piece together. Is that right? Up. Uh, I got you on mute. Absolutely. Uh, and if anyone, <laughs> and if anyone wants to uh, get into sports analytics, I mean, you can, Bill's book, football study hall, in addition to the website that is still up and archived is, is absolutely necessary reading. Um, yes. So I, I think those five factors are a great heuristic for kind of interpreting what happens. I am a little bit more agnostic about a couple of things. Um, I treat all drives as successes or failures. I, I do not count. Um, I don't give you negative points for a safety. I don't give you negative points for, for an, an interception that you throw that goes back for a touchdown because that's so random, right? That confuses our understanding, in my opinion, um, because what that does is that that penalizes you for the spatial distribution of players on one play, like disproportionately. Uh, an interception is bad, 
And in the, in the sense of, you know, creating the narrative of a game, an interception return for a touchdown is, hey, this might be the reason that they lost here. But in terms of assessing a team's quality, that's no different than an interception where the guy caught the ball and he kneeled it, right? The, the problem there is still the quarterback made a bad throw um, or the defender made a good play and you lost an opportunity to score. Football is a game of opportunities. I say this all the time and it's kind of a joke, but it's not untrue. College football is a lot more like bowling than, than we want to, than we want to believe because it's a series of drives and it's a series of ch- turnovers and chances. Um, and so what my net, uh, my net XPBD does is really kind of looks at the idea that a drive that has a first down at an opponent's 22 that ends in a turnover and a drive that has a first down at the opponent's 22 and ends in a touchdown are the same in expectation, right? Before, before anything else, the drive still reached the same value. And we only see the censored value of zero or seven. Um, and so what I do is do a little bit of, you know, weird statistical nonsense that just says, Hey, I'm, I have a pretty good idea. I can bound the value of a drive and get a non-zero non-seven number for each drive, um, uh, accounting for the randomness of turnovers and stuff that, that I, I think are a little noisy. And so that, that dials in a little bit more kind of a per drive, a per opportunity uh, stat, which is net XPPD is, um, the other one that I, that I kind of play around with on that line is, is something I'm, I'm tentatively calling echo. Um, and, uh, it is the ratio of productive drives. So it's, it's ripped almost straight from hockey hockey. They have a stat called Corsi, the statistician named it Corsi because this assistant coach on his favorite team had an amazing mustache. And he thought, I like that guy. <laughs> I named my stat echo, uh, after the fullback on the Navy team that had like a 16 minute drive in 2003 or whatever. That's phenomenal. Uh, I just felt like it was, you know, a beefy fullback was the right name for, for game control because time of possession really, really annoys me. Um, and how you control a game is not related to how long you hold a ball. It's how, how well you use your drives versus how well you let your opponent use your drives. And so a quality possession there, like a, a productive possession is where you get a first down on opponent territory, or you have a big play touchdown. Right. And so all Echol does is kind of give us an idea of how often are you getting those? How often are you allowing those, which gives us a better idea for expectations about how productive your offense is. I absolutely love it. Um, it college football has changed a lot. It, you're, you're taking some of those, five factors that we that we just talked about. Um, are those five factors still kind of uh, the holy quinfecta, I guess? Or is there more or, or maybe less that we should look at uh, when it comes to, you know, trying to predict outcomes? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, Bill does pretty well uh, predicting predicting outcomes. So like, I can't say anything against that. Uh, I, well, I will he, say that he like, updates, let me interrupt you. He updates his SP Plus uh, basically every year. He tries to tweak it. He comes up with... Uh, different things that he tosses in recruiting. He tosses in uh, uh, past results a little bit to give it a little more weight. Um, so there's obviously more to it than just the five factors. But in a in a game-on-game situation, once you've got a little bit of data, maybe you're four games, five games into the season, and you've got something on paper, uh, those would be the five, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I, uh, I think the biggest difference between that and and me is just i just don't care as much about turnovers uh, <laughs> yeah. well it's all luck right 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 yeah and, and and it's it it is and it isn't and like obviously some people can coach and kind of enforce it but again that's just such a small fraction of your total plays that i don't think it improves my no i not i don't think i know it does not improve my predictions um and and, and so in reality though you you kind of go to first principles and you look at okay how consistently are you moving the ball? Um, how explosive are you? Uh, and so if you're really consistent, but you're not explosive, uh, you're not really going to get those break free touchdowns. But if you're not really consistent and you're relying on explosiveness, you're, you're, you're going to have trouble getting enough opportunities to score. Um, and so you have to have some kind of measure of efficiency and explosiveness because even if explosive plays are random, that's kind of the, those go hand in hand. But then I, I really like to look, you know, using, using field for field position in my drive value stat and, and kind of adjusting for that is saying, given where you started, what did you do? Um, and so I, I like to think of football being more about opportunity and what you did with it. Um, and so I really think that 
however you put legs on efficiency, explosiveness, and field position, um, the, you're, you're going to hover around the same thing. Um, and, and it just comes down to degrees about like, what do you think is important in terms of, you know, should I penalize a team for this? Should I penalize a team for that? Like, um, in, interceptions and EPA are all based on, you know, the, the average value of an interception. Uh, so I recode all of them just because again, I don't think that you should be disproportionately punished just because your receiver fell down and the opponent, you know, ran 60 yards for a touchdown on an interception, for instance. Um, it's more important that, Hey, you had this opportunity and you wasted it. And that's what my drive based stats really capture um, is kind of, Hey, uh, you, you're, you're pretty efficient. You're pretty um, explosive, but you, you don't get a lot of opportunities or you get a lot of opportunities and you don't do anything with it because you stall on a certain aspect of your game. And so those five factors are, are great and, and inarguable as important facets, but defining those specifically, I think is a little, um, a little different. Like for instance, I don't, I don't love havoc rate uh, just because I think one it's, it's coded weirdly. It's, it's inconsistent there. And it's it's a little bit um, well. Have a great includes a it, several different defensive metrics, right? I mean, there's yeah. there's a, a quarterback pressure that you can toss. I mean, a lot of people do it uh, different ways, but there's sacks. Um, but sometimes the sack isn't. Uh, I don't know how to explain it the best way. It's it, some sacks are more important than others. Uh, yeah, well, maybe some quarterback are, some pressure fault. Some yeah. of the defenders extra effort. Yeah. So a lot of those things are observationally equivalent and like the direction I'm trying to go is trying to get more into as data sources be getting more, get more valuable uh, and more, excuse me, as data sources get more available, looking at things like, Hey, let's, let's take out the screen game when we're evaluating someone's passing game. Just recently through kind of scraping, I was able to, I'm able to separate designed quarterback runs outside of scrambles. And so that gives me more information about, you know, as a guy running for his life and generating value, like Max, uh, my favorite stat, 2019, uh, PFF tweeted this, that Max Duggan created the most value with his legs behind Trevor Lawrence in 2019. And it's literally like, oh yeah, because Max Duggan is, running for his life on third and long and getting a first down most times. So like, that's not, that's, they were not trying to do that. Um, and so that is what I'm, uh, you know, you know, stuff like that, where you just get a little more granular that makes sense. Again, a lot of that is on the offensive side because defense is so hard to measure because there just aren't that many sacks, even something like pass breakups, which have recently become available. That's only a few, you know, that's so, that's so few, observations of a play-by-play relationship between a receiver and a defensive back uh, where so much happened that we really can't quantify. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it, it, it's just kind of, I mean, it's a mess because we have limited data, but I, th- I think there are interesting ways to kind of say, all right, we know what's generally important when we try to evaluate a team. Yeah. Um, how can we define that, refine that in a way that's going to make, uh, make my knowledge better going forward? It's, it, it's, Perfect example, you were talking about the turnover uh, situation. You know, a turnover shouldn't be uh, that much of a penalty, et cetera. Ole Miss played at Arkansas last year, and Matt Corral had, uh, what, six turnovers? Or six interceptions in that game? But you yeah. could tell when he wasn't throwing turnovers, when he wasn't throwing interceptions, that Ole Miss was a better football team than Arkansas last year. Like, you could see it on the field, the way that they were going up and down the field, but the turnovers killed them. I mean, they ended up losing by, I think, 13 points. Uh, they would have scored significantly more than that. It's exactly what you're talking about. You brought up Max Duggan. I got to talk about TCU a little bit. Um, I love the 247 team talent ranking. Uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that TCU was number three in the Big 12 as far as team talent. They were number 28 nationally. Now, Texas is number one at number five, uh, and they always underperform that, seems like. And Oklahoma was number nine nationally, so they were uh, number two in the Big 12. Obviously, talent is not everything. You know, you got to be able to coach and develop, et cetera. It is a good starting point, though. And if you look at what TCU already has on the roster and what they were able to bring in, uh, you know, they only brought in 14 recruits this past season, or this, uh, this past recruiting class back in February. But they also brought in five really good transfers, a uh, couple of the guys from Memphis. You know, you got T.J. Carter, the cornerback. you got, uh, uh, let's see, Banks, the wide receiver from A&M. You know, he was a former four-star. This looks to be Gary Patterson's most talented team at TCU. What, what are the expectations? What do you think this team is capable of this season? This team is absolutely capable of competing for a Big 12 championship and playing in the, uh, 
in the Big 12 championship game. Um, I, I think the pieces are here for this team to be better than 2017. Now, granted, that that rests on a couple things happening um, that, are, that are far from guaranteed to happen, especially on the offensive side of the ball. So defense, not worried. Uh, people are going to see, you know, you lose our Darius Washington, Garrett Wallow, and um, and Trevon Merrig from the from the you know the back seven, and you think, oh no, there's a lot of turnover. But that 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 really hasn't been an issue with TCU. They bring in Carter. I think Carter's actually going to switch over to safety, which is going to provide them nice depth. They've got two cornerbacks who are really good, um, and a lot of guys who played a lot of reps the last two years due to injuries and stuff. And so, um, I, I think the defense I'm not as worried about, especially when you have you know Kari Coleman um, and Oshawn Mathis as as defensive ends who who should have substantially better defensive you know, play uh, along the line, uh, especially I'm getting too wonky here. Sorry, but like the four, two, five <laughs> defense that Gary Patterson runs. If you don't have a defensive end who can, who can get to the quarterback, you, you can't do anything. You put too much pressure on your defensive backs. And so I think that'll be an improvement. So you have some of these things that are automatically just, Hey, just by the style of guy that they're going to have are going to be better than they were last year. Even as you have some transform uh, transformation along the line. Um, I think TCU's offensive line was was one of the worst in the country last year, uh, and a lot of that was due to injury. They started, I think, nine guys. Um, they, you know, started a walk-on for multiple games. Steve Avila, who's a great center, was playing right tackle just because they just couldn't they, they couldn't figure out how to get guys healthy and playing and everything. And so it was just an absolute mess. Um, and so bringing in Obina Easy from Memphis is a, a huge um, upgrade over TJ Storman at tackle. It would have been nice if the Frogs could have convinced TJ Storman to play on the right side of the line, but I understand that he wanted to be a left tackle and I get that. Um, so again, I think the offensive line was kind of the limiting factor last year. And now you've got a wealth of skill players. You know, Zach Evans is going to be the guy, especially now that Darwin Barlow's um, transferred and, and Quentin Johnson is, is a name that everyone should know. Um, he is, he is one of the best deep threat wide receivers. Uh, what we've been saying around the TCU sphere is, you know, TCU hasn't had a Quentin, Quentin Johnston since Josh Doxson. Um, he's that kind of deep, deep threat playmaker. And, and, and then you get to the question of like Max Duggan. Okay. Max Duggan has to take a step. He absolutely does. But Max Duggan is somebody who we've seen his development in real time, which is a little bit unfair in our perception. So a lot of guys of Max Duggan's caliber would sit for two years, compete for a starting job, job their junior year, and then have the job for two years. Yes. Duggan came in and should have redshirted. Um, if TCU's development pipeline was correct, if they, their recruits had panned out, you know, Sean Robinson and, uh, and Justin Rogers, Max Duggan would not have seen the light of day in 2019. Um, and then 2020, uh, Duggan has a, you know, a heart condition that's just terrifying, but I'm so glad they found it and were able to fix it and everything, but still he loses whatever short off season he has and has to deal with all that. And so I think Max Duggan is a lot better than he gets credit for just because he was not supposed to be starting. He had some serious offensive issues. Um, and, and I think they will be better this year. The, the, the key for an outsider to look at TCU and say, what, you know, what are they going to do? What can they do is, is looking at the Oklahoma state game last year. Uh, you know, TCU went down early, the offense kind of stalled and they went back to the same old, same old, you know, screens and goes kind oh, of yeah. nonsense that doesn't work. And Jerry kill who TCU hired in kind of this innovative, you know, offensive head coach role uh, was sitting on the sideline with Doug Meacham, who's now the, the, the sole uh, offense coordinator and pointing at the play sheet. And they were checking things off and you're saying, Nope, we're not running this. We're not running this. We're not running this. And they went back to kind of this jet sweep play action uh, middle of the field intermediate game and it worked just so well um, and so I think that's you know if TCU is going well this year they're going to be kind of running this like jet sweep power air raid and uh, and that'll be a lot more suited to Max Duggan's skill sets especially with his legs and so this team can go as far as as the offensive design takes them uh, if you know if the offensive line holds um, the only problem is that you know Every other team in the Big 12 has been circling 2021 on their calendar as being the year for for, for a couple of years yes. now. Oklahoma, uh, Iowa State, uh, Oklahoma State, even, uh, and and I think Kansas State with with Skylar Thompson back. So you've got a, a lot of competition that are saying, "Oh, 2021 is our year," which is very unfortunate because TCU hasn't had a year in a while, and, and they're trying to make 2021 <laughs> there. Yo, so I'm excited for the Big 12. I think it's wide open. I think TCU is absolutely a player. Uh, I have them slotted in as second in my power rankings right now. Um, uh, just because I, I really do think that Duggan is underrated, and I think the the rushing attack is going to be hard to hard to stop. Um, but I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of talent in the Big Twelve, and there's a lot of just really really smart offense and a lot of really good defense that there hasn't been in the last couple of years. No, it's the idea of it. I guess the um, what the Big Twelve is doing has shifted over the past you know five ten years, and and now all of the rest of college football is kind of running what the SEC is doing. It's 
up tempo really fast, get the ball out, get your playmakers in space. And the Big 12 has kind of reeled it back in a little bit. And it's it's fun to see uh, the climate change. You know, it's yeah. it's different. So I enjoy it very much. TCU is, uh, is a very big wild card. Now, changing subjects, I can't let you go without talking about the playoff, right? Everybody has to have an opinion on the playoff. Uh, personally, I'm still a little bit torn. I think that I like it. I was always a, uh, as Josh Pate says on 247, a, a four and no more guy, right? But when I look at like the societal shift into where this sport came from, where it was totally regional, and now it is a, a national sport, it's sometimes even international, global sport, I, I think getting more teams involved in the postseason aspect of it is, is better, I think it's better for the fans. I think it's better for growing the sport. Uh, and people call it, you know, a mini NFL and and all this. But I think there are definitely some positives. I don't think it's going to change the outcome of who ends up there at the end. At least not right now. It, it'll take a decade or more to be able to shift that kind of stuff out. Um, but if you look at, at the progression of college football, this was always going to be the case, right? In the 80s, they have the lawsuit that gets the TV rights back to the schools, which, of course, goes back to the conferences. Uh, In the 90s, you had the first conference championship game in 92. That was the first real case of kind of degrading the the regular season. In 98, you start with the BCS. That kind of degrades the regular season a little bit because, I mean, we all remember Nebraska getting in after getting walloped by Colorado. You know, all those kind of things that happened in the BCS. And... And then you move into the 14 playoff, and then all of a sudden you expect the entity that bought it that kind of runs college football to not just focus on the playoff. Uh, that was never going to happen. So you you move it out to 12. You get more teams involved later in the season. It's some of the games, Alabama, LSU, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, you know, whatever, those games that might have had playoff implications before now are more for just seeding sometimes. Um, but you do have more games that matter later in the season. And I think, I think this could be a good thing. What are, what are your thoughts here? I think it's important to ask ourselves, what is college football for and who is college football for? What, what is the good in college football? And what the suits will tell you is that the good in college football is a game that starts at 9 p.m. on Monday night in January uh, at a neutral site um, with, you know, $17 beers and, 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 you know, Kendrick Lamar playing at halftime, which is, I love Kendrick Lamar. That's awesome. But um, that's not, that, that's not what college football is. It's um, ridiculous. Co- college football <laughs> is um, having an 11 a.m. beer with your college roommate at the local bar and uh, walking across campus to a tailgate, meeting up with your friends, going inside and, and watching until it's too hot for you to stay and you have to go home. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I really think that, you know, we're going to have to look ourselves in the look ourselves in the mirror and decide what do we want. And, I, and I'm going to say unequivocally, I want more of Appalachian State and Louisiana on a Friday night um, than I do, you know, LSU and Alabama at uh, 7 p.m. on Monday of Labor Day or whatever, you know, whatever big games happening this year. So that's my lens of the playoff committee. Um, generally, it's just that I, I actually am for bowl anarchy. I think uh, having a national championship and making that the end of the sport is um, only a vehicle for TV revenue. And I think my cynicism is probably justified just in, you know, looking specifically at TCU, who in 2009 with one loss was was left out entirely, uh, or excuse me, 2008, 2010 wasn't given a chance, uh, despite the fact that they did everything that anyone could have done and still went and beat, beat a very good Wisconsin team in the, in the Rose Bowl. Um, and then you look at 2011, they stumbled once in non-con, uh, you know, lost to Baylor, lost to SMU. They were 11 and two convincingly beat everyone else, had some injury issues and still, you know, points at a bowl. Um, and so there's this whole narrative of, Hey, you can't be at the big boys table cause you're not an automatic qualifier. And then things get reformed. And then what happens? Well, 2014, Oh, uh, actually your losses don't matter. It's only your wins that matter. So Ohio state can lose, you know, two scores uh, at home to, to a team that lost to an FCS team and they get in, but, but you who lost by three on the road on the back of a 
pass interference call, uh, is, you know, you can't, you can't be in the playoff. And then 2015 even, um, got left out of the New Year's six entirely after going, you know, 10 and two, uh, in a, in a really loaded big 10. And then the same thing or big, big 12. And the same thing in 2017, where just absolutely, you know, the Texas with four losses gets to go to the sugar bowl, but TCU, uh, with, with two, and then having to play Oklahoma again, gets left out entirely for a team that didn't even go to their conference championship game. So my problem with the college football playoff committee is that I don't trust them because all they care about is TV revenue. Yes. And you know, the, the analogy that I have kind of in my head is if, if someone <laughs> punches me in the face every morning at 8 AM, right. They walk up to me and that's the deal. Every morning they just punch me in the face <laughs> and they say, you know what? We've heard your pleas. Instead, we're only going to punch you every other day at 8 AM. Um, that's not an improvement, right? Like that's still, that's still a bad deal. And so I think we need some, some reform more than just expansion. Um, again, ask people, would Coastal Carolina have been given an opportunity to play themselves in a playoff last year? Uh, and people want to cite the rankings and say, well, they would have been in the top 12. So yes, and absolutely they would not have been. Yeah. The, the, the committee, yeah. look at what they did at UCF in 2017. Um, the committee absolutely would have changed their rankings to, to make sure only one G5 team goes there. I think the biggest loser here is actually the, the American Athletic Conference, who now... Um, is, is, is going to be, uh, you know, competing with the, the best of the Sunbelt and the Mountain West and everything to fight off when in reality, their conference is closer to the PAC 12 than it is the Sunbelt. Yes. Um, and so to, to, you know, to have this kind of nonsense and only have one spot for the G fives is again, if you want to have a national championship, everyone should have an opportunity to play themselves in. Um, and, and that is not the case right now. Um, and so I think we should just say, look, ESPN is going to continue to commodify college football. Those of us who enjoy college football can, can take a stand and say, you know what, the playoff happens. That's fine. But, but the best of college football is, is, you know, yelling at your rival who has a flag up, you know, two, two, do- uh, two doors down, uh, and, and, and having a lot of fun at football games and understanding, you know, the storylines of these people who are at your alma mater. And, and, and so there's so many good things about college football. And I think the playoff, um, if, if we give, if we give college football to the playoff, uh, we'll never get it back. I, I do agree with you on a lot of that. Uh, however, I will let you know that you and I both sound like old men when we talk about that. So, you know, at the, the generation that they want being able to watch football in the future wants playoffs. They want all of this kind of stuff. So there's, I do think there are a lot of negatives associated with it. The amount of games that, that could possibly be played by these kids without making money, that's a negative, right? The idea that these games are not going to mean as much, that's definitely a negative, right? The Alabama-LSU game won't mean as much. Alabama-Auburn, the kick six would not have kept Alabama out of a playoff, right? But on the other hand, uh, both teams get in. There are more games that matter more towards the end of the season. More fans across the country are interested. And that I see as being uh, a pretty big deal. I I do wonder if eventually we will get away from Now, I love the bowl system because I love... Um, I, I take that back. I don't love how the bowl system is done because there's a lot of rigging around, but I do love the fact that we do have bowl games on random Tuesdays with Buffalo and whoever, right? Coastal Carolina or whoever that I can sit and watch either in the office or when I'm at home with family over the holidays or whatever. I love watching football, any kind of football, at which it, some people agree, disagree. I mean, I've, I've sat at home and watched the spring league uh, over the past couple of months. So I've, I've, I don't enjoy it a whole lot. It's not great football, but it is football, and it makes me feel better uh, when, when I sit there and watch it. So there is a lot to to dissect with it, and it's, you know, I'm torn. I do think there can be some good from it, uh, but there still needs to be way more changes. But, I, you know, my co-host Chris, he talks a lot about, can we just get it to a point where it sits still for, you know, four or five years? Can we just get somewhere? Because there are sweeping changes, it feels like, every year, whether it's with the rules or with a team switching conferences or schedule changes or this. Like, can we just, can we just set it somewhere? Because right now, you know, they're talking about doing away with divisions in some of the other conferences. Uh, I mean, you obviously in the Big 12, that's not been an issue. There's only 10 teams, there's no divisions. It's a round robin. But in the SEC, I, I thought it was great. And he said that. I'm done with it. We've got all these other changes. Just leave that how it is for now. I I would say do away with all the divisions. I'd say, that, have, have you read the, I forget the guy's name, uh, where he talked about doing like a Champions League 
type deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw I saw that today uh, on Twitter, and I think I think there's just so much political economy in college football oh, that yes. anything like that is not. I mean, and here's the thing. Five and seven Texas is not getting sent down. I don't care what re- relegation scheme you can think oh, yeah. of in your head. That's not how that's not how college football has worked. That's not how it's going to work. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunities there. Again, it, it, uh, as in you know life and and public policy, it'd be really nice to hit the switch back to zero and just start afresh. And you you can't. You yes. have to deal with the baggage of the rivalries and the fact that like for as much sense as it doesn't make, Texas A and M and Texas are not going to be in the same conference again ever. Yeah, um, there and, are and, there and, are and, contracts that are drawn out. Notre Dame and the ACC have a contract that's all the way through 2037. That is absurd. Like, yeah, why do we have, uh, yeah. like, bowl contracts are done for years and years. Like, why do we have all these things? And, and yes, if we, so I had uh, Ivan Mazel on last week, and we talked about the biggest change uh, that forever kind of destroyed what college football is was the TV revenue deal back in, uh, what was it, 84, I think it was, Oklahoma and Georgia sued the NCAA for their television rights. And, and that shifted everything because it was mm-hmm. not, but, it was less than a decade until we got the conference championship games that Roy Kramer, the former commissioner of the SEC, brought in. And and that, in and of itself, kind of degraded the regular season. Alabama went in at 11-0 and against a, a 9-2 and Florida. Well, Florida, with two losses, would not have been SEC champions. Uh, and yet, here we are. You know, they're playing for an SEC championship game with two losses. And in the past, even a year earlier than that, uh, Alabama would have been in that national championship race no matter what, and and they did end up winning. But yeah. you know, it, there's there's all sorts of examples of this if you go back and actually pay attention. And yeah, I, Ivan really kind of brought it home. He was like, yeah, like that's that's when it started, you know. And he's yeah. been covering it since uh, since 1981. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's a yeah, whole that, different that's deal. that's a convincing argument. And I think the biggest, you know, if I was going to try and squeeze a little bit of positivity out of this, which is, you know, always so hard for me. Um, one, one of the biggest problems, especially in 2020, uh, just kind of came to a head was like the bull opt outs. And again, I don't begrudge a, a 22 year old looking at his future and saying, it's not worth pulling out my knee to go try and beat Oklahoma in the show in the cotton bowl, man. Like that's just not worth it. Um, but you know, increasing the playoff is going to make some of those new year six games that might've been affected by opt outs not be. Um, and so I understand that. I think that's, that's good for the sport, even if there are some, you know, other bigger picture factors that are kind of less than desirable about just, just saying, Hey, let's do what we're doing, but, but do it bigger. Um, again, I'm for bowl anarchy. I'm for competing national championship claims. I, I think that we too often demand a satisfying revol- resolution when in reality, we don't, we don't need one. No, we don't need one. But but uh, the societal shift, there must be one. There must yeah. be one. So it's it's completely ridiculous. I have kept you for way longer than I anticipated, but I certainly appreciate you for doing it. If you guys uh, want to go and check him out, he is Parker Fleming. You can find him on Twitter at Stats of War or his website, cfb-graphs.com. Parker, you are the best, brother. Thank you for joining me on Winning Cures Everything today. Thanks so much, Gary. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.